nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. The next feature that we look at is again the emitter. So now let's talk about, sorry. So the next topic is RTDs with relaxation scattering in the emitter. So the, in the previous section we've seen that the emitter bound states are very important for the injection of the current. But there was something quite missing in that treatment. What we've seen here, and I'm flashing this on the screen, is that the emitter bound state E1 is changing on the logarithmic scale as a function of bias. It becomes extremely narrow. And it gets smaller than the central resonance state. And we've also seen that this emitter state E2 is remaining pretty broad. So this emitter state E2 roughly stays hovering above the barrier. It's like an above the barrier resonance. And in this particular RTD, the state E1 is being pulled into the CF electrodes. So far, so good. But what that really means is you have found a truly bound state. But on the other hand, in the previous plots, I had shown you that there's a lot of charge sitting in that emitter. There's actually a sheet density charge of roughly 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 12 per square centimeter. Lots of electrons, lots of scattering, lots of incoherent processes. A truly bound state really doesn't exist there. That bound state actually interacts with all the electrons that are sit up here. It is broadened. So if it's broadened by, say, a typical scattering rate of polar optical phonons of 0.1 picoseconds, that would correspond to a width of roughly 6 millielectron volt. If you just take a general scattering rate of 0.1 picosecond and convert h bar over 2 tau, you get, two, uh, you get 6 millielectron volts. That's this flashing light here up in red. Okay, so this emitter bound state E1 should really not be narrower than this energy here. Okay, it will be broadened by the presence of all these other electrons to be about that width. And we had shown in the previous slides that the width of this resonance actually determines the current flow. Right? So we're under predicting, so to speak, this resonance width. That means we're under predicting the current by a lot, by orders of magnitude. So we have to find a solution for that. And that solution is one of the key elements or the key achievements of this nemo Wandi tool that was developed at Texas Instruments. To develop a boundary condition that can actually treat the states in the emitter properly. Where you assume that there is strong scattering and that there is a relaxation in the emitter. And that was a key achievement to model resonant tunneling diodes properly. So this is a key element for you to understand how this works from the physics inside. So what we introduced in NEMO, and this is published in an APL in 94, is that we introduced the so-called optical potential in I eta as h bar over 2 tau, and we call that a relaxation in the emitter, and that mimics the broadening through scattering. And that key turned out to be a key element. So I'll walk you later through a chart like this, but basically, if you introduce this eta in the emitter, your emitter bound state 
is first very broad because it's loosely bound, and then it roughly just tapers out to the six millectron volt value. So it then is a couple of orders of magnitude broader than the central resonance. Right? So this central resonance line here in red that I show on the bottom right is the same width here. So that this width doesn't change a whole lot. That means the central resonance by itself is not affected by the resonance width on the left. When they couple to each other, you see a little bump, and you see the little bump here. When they interact with each other, the resonances change a little bit in width, right? Because you have a bonding and anti-bonding state, and it modifies the resonance width. Okay? So that's sort of the conceptual thing you have to understand of what's important. Now, there's another concept that you really have to understand. How is this being done? And the, the way it's being done, it's really by device partitioning. We, di we di divide the device into three regions. First of all, we take this emitter as, an, as a reservoir and we treat it in equilibrium. So even though maybe you have band bending and quantum states, you treat the whole left as a reservoir, as an emitter. That means you don't carry, you don't compute current in that region either. You just assume that there's a flat Fermi level and there's no current. And you do the same for the collector. From a computational sense, that is nice. Because you can do just equilibrium green functions. Because there's no current, there's, it's all in equilibrium. It makes the computation a little bit easier. <coughs> And it also implies that you can do whatever you want to do in terms of scattering, so you do the easy thing. You assume infinitely strong scattering, meaning equilibrium. Everything is just broadened out to an equilibrium value. So you really have very strong scattering, which numerically you could barely compute. We still today wouldn't be able to compute electron-electron scattering properly in a resonant tunneling diode or in any, any other nanoelectronic device on a quantum level. It is it, it, computationally too expensive, but we know it's important. So we stick it in with an empirical relaxation. The interesting part is that this I eta, this optical potential, is added to the Hamiltonian in the reservoirs that makes this Hamiltonian non-Hermitian. And if you computed current in here, if you did do that, current would not be conserved. In fact, you would be losing carriers. But we don't compute current there, we just do green functions, and we only compute the equilibrium charge, and we don't lose charge. The next thing is that you treat the central device under non-equilibrium, and you do non-equilibrium green functions in the central region. And the central region experiences all the potential in all the states on the left and the right through self-energies. And I'll walk you through how that is being done. But the key element is, this is not a per perturbative treatment in a sense. This is an exact treatment. What this non-equilibrium region sees is on the left and the right, electrostatic potentials and resonance states that are treated exactly. It's just the occupation of these states is in equilibrium, and the occupation of these states on the right is in equilibrium. And in the center, you do non-equilibrium green functions, and you can compute the occupation there properly. 